Hey, so in this video, I'm going to talk about responding to security threats. So once you have um, identified possibly some kind of vulnerability in an information system, whether that is personal or organizational, uh, you have to respond to it. You have to put safeguards up in place to prevent that potential threat from actually being exploited by some malicious actor. So this is a lot of preventative work in order to prevent well, bad things from happening, both on the personal and organizational level. We'll start with the personal security safeguards really quick. Um, take security seriously. This is a big deal. Like we talked about in the last video, uh, millions of dollars have been lost due to security um, breaches. So it's really important to take security seriously when you're building a new information system, whether that's setting up a new laptop or building an entire information system for an organization, it's really important to build with security in mind from the start and to follow good security practices through not just any work you do with any organization, but also your own life, because it could save you a lot of trouble. And the aim of some of these videos is to sort of talk about these security practices that might be a little bit helpful. What you can also do is create strong passwords and use multiple passwords. Um, now we'll talk about this a little more in just a second, but I, uh, I did link that one interview with Edward Snowden when he was talking about how to make really, really good passwords and that information still holds true to this day. Um, I'll go over it a little bit and I'll also make sure to relink that video again. So if you haven't had a chance to see it, you might be able to see it again. Do not send valuable data via um, email or instant messaging um, with a little bit of a catch because there are safe ways to do this, but you want to be really, really, really careful and deliberate about how you transfer data especially um, very sensitive data over to people. You want to make sure that that data is uh, encrypted. We'll talk more about encryption in a little bit, but you want, you want to make sure that nobody is able to actually see what that data is. If they're just some random third party who is uh, sniffing your conversation in a sense. Also anybody who might be able to get access to either your email or the other person that you're talking to, their email, your IM or their IM platforms. Those are all weak points as well. So it's better to use safer methods. Uh, there's ways of transferring things securely and safely. And then you want to use HTTPS as much as possible. Um, I'll, I'll actually talk about how HTTPS works, why it's different from HTTP and why you should use it in the future, but a general um, a general recommendation is to use HTTPS HTTPS as much as possible when you're connecting to websites. Make sure that the URL starts with HTTPS, not HTTP. And there are browser extensions that can enforce this. There are also um, settings in certain web browsers that can enforce this. They can actually force you to use HTTPS and either give you a warning that the website you're visiting does not have an HTTPS version and only can be visited through HTTP uh, when you try to connect to them, letting you know that, hey, proceed with caution. Your, com your communication with this website may not be safe and this website may not be who they are saying they are. They might not be able to authenticate who they say they are. Um, regarding that, uh, those extensions and stuff like that, I am actually going to put together a canvas page full of my recommendations. I'm not going to put them into video specifically because, uh, surely my recommendations will be out of date very quickly. So I will have to keep on updating that, uh, as time moves on and all that kind of stuff. So any specifics will go in that canvas page like that. 
Now you also want to remove any high value assets from computers. So if you have any really, really, really important data uh, just sitting around on a computer that you lug around anywhere, um, that can be really bad. So you want to either leave that data on servers at the organization you work for or leave that data at home if it's um, anything that's really important to you on, in your home life and that kind of stuff like uh, let's say tax information, payment information, uh, medical information, all that kind of stuff. You want to leave that at home if you can. Uh, external drives are not too expensive these days if you try to go for the right type. Uh, if you get an external HDD, you should be able to get it for under $100 at a pretty good size and you can leave that backup drive at home. And if you need to take your computer with you, make sure that you know none of that data is on there. Uh, reason being, if your computer gets stolen, it is possible for a hacker to crack into your actual information and try to sell that information. Although it's also very possible that they just wipe your computer and uh, try to resell it, but you don't want to take the chance. Uh, regularly clearing your browsing history, temporary files, and cookies. Um, this is a little bit more on the, uh, if you're, I, I would say it's more on the, if you're doing like really, really sensitive work side. Um, if you are frequently logging into a medical provider to, uh, you know, send messages, schedule appointments, that kind of, look at your health history, that kind of stuff if you are frequently logging into your banking account, all that kind of stuff. The history can show uh, what websites you have actually visited, which can be sensitive information in and of itself, depending on what you're doing. But there's also temporary files and cookies. Now, cookies are small files that a website will store on your computer for any number of reasons. Um, one of the most common reasons is if you log into a website, they will store this little cookie on your website that says, hey, I am currently logged in as myself, as this person. And if you leave that website and then go back to that website and start doing stuff on there, that website can access that cookie. They can say, oh, uh, this cookie is already here. And it looks like they were authenticated as this user, so I will let this person do work as this user. So that's the reason actually why you stay logged into websites, uh, like you know a social media site or an email site or something like that, is because they have stored cookies on your webs on your actual computer. Now, this can be bad because those cookies can also be possibly abused to. Um, actually gain access into those kinds of websites. Typically the cookies have an expiration date. So if you get logged out of something out of after like one hour of not using it or something like that, that would be the cookie kind of expiring. Now temporary files might also be known as the cache of a website, uh, C-A-C-H-E. And what that is, is the website storing files on your computer in order to make that website run a little bit faster if you're frequently browsing. So if you visit a site, they might store like some information about the website's uh, styles and themes and some of the text and all that kind of stuff. They might also store images because images can be really hard to transmit over the internet. So if you see an image on every single page of the website, uh, the website might try to put that image on your computer and then you can, your computer can just load the image from itself rather than having to download that image again every single time you're going through the website. So it speeds up browsing in that sense. However, some of those pictures could also be um, sensitive. They could contain sensitive data. This is a hypothetical, but it's very possible that you have sensitive data involving, let's say, banking or medical or stuff like that stored on your computer. It's not guaranteed that this is the case, and it's kind of hard to tell exactly what a website is actually storing on your computer, what temporary files they're putting on your computer, um, wh whether they're sensitive or not. Uh, it's, it, it's kind of hard to say, uh, 
But if you want to really have a security minded approach to this, what you want to do is frequently clear this browsing history and temporary files and cookies, which you can do from your browser. Um, the textbook recommends CCleaner. <laughs> do not use CCleaner. I'll talk about that in a little bit. But you can do it from your browser. There are also other Windows utilities that help you do that kind of stuff if you really need to. But typically your browser is able to get rid of that kind of stuff and you can minimize the chance of sensitive data on your computer. Now you want an antivirus software and you want to regularly update it. We'll talk a little more about antivirus software in a little bit. Now security is only as good as sort of the weakest link in the organizational security chain, I guess. So if you're the only security minded person, then there's still security vulnerabilities from other people in the organization. So not only do you want to be practicing good security culture, you also want to encourage other people to practice good security culture. In my experience, the major hurdle here is convincing them why it's important to do that and why it's okay for them to give up a little bit of convenience. For example, clearing browser history, temporary files and cookies, which also there are um, extensions that automatically do some of this. I'll talk about that in the um, page that I make as well. Um, regardless, you have to get people over the hurdle of being uncomfortable with something new, being uncomfortable with a little bit less convenience in order to convince them that, hey, security is a good thing to do here. It's hard to do. Just from my personal experience, it can be very hard to do. But in a setting where you are working with very sensitive data, it's extremely important. Now, in a similar manner, you want to follow organizational security directives and guidelines because they are there in order to protect everyone and the sensitive information that might be working with, whether that's uh, personal information that's being held by the company or actual um, sensitive data that the company is using for business, say if it's a medical company or something like that. So th those directives are there for a reason, specifically because it is bad if they are not followed. So you want to follow them, you want to study them, you want to be familiar with them, and you want to follow them. And consider security for all business initiatives. Build with security from the start. Um, security is hard to do if it's tacked on top of something that's insecure. You have to integrate it in from the very beginning. All right, so let's talk about passwords. Passwords are very important. They're important to create because you need them to log in. Otherwise, anyone would be able to log into your accounts and pretend like they're you and do bad things. So you want to make passwords, but you also want to make them good. Well, what do I mean by good? Well, let's talk about what I mean by good passwords. I mean, good passwords can be kind of hard to define, but we can easily talk about bad passwords. So there's a thing called a password dictionary. If a hacker is trying to break into a company, some company, like let's say uh, bank.com, they're trying to break into a bank. And what they're going to do is they're going to try a whole bunch of different passwords with different usernames. So we have passwords like these, one, two, three, four, five, six, password three, QWERTY uh, UAP, or something like that. These password dictionaries are going to contain a whole bunch of very commonly used passwords as well as slight variants of those commonly used passwords because someone might say, oh, well, I normally use one, two, three, four, five, but I've heard that's bad. So I'm going to put six at the end and no one is ever going to guess that. Well, the password dictionaries are going to have all kinds of things. They'll contain, you know, things like password. Password three also would be a, a good candidate for something in a password dictionary. For QWERTY YOP, um, they might replace that O with a zero and put an exclamation mark at the end to represent uh, someone trying to modify QWERTY UAP with 
uh, to fit a uh, bank's or whatever uh, password requirements. So you're going to have a whole bunch of really insecure passwords and they're going to try to break their way in using these insecure passwords and hoping that they're able to um, figure out uh, someone's login information like this. So a bad password like this will be something commonly used like 12345, password 3, or yop. Something that is easy to guess. So then what's good is to have a mix of uppercase and lowercase letters, numbers, and special characters. And the reason why is because if you just have a password that only has lowercase letters, uh, a, uh, and that password is four characters long, there would only be um, 26 to the fourth power number of passwords that a password that a hacker would have to guess in order to figure out your password if they were trying every single possible combination, which sounds like a lot, but computers are very fast, so it may not even be that many. However, if you also mix in uppercase letters, then you have 52 to the fourth power. And then also numbers would be 62 to the fourth power and special characters that just goes into crazy town there. So mixing in different you know, uppercase and lowercase, mixing in numbers, special characters, all that kind of stuff can prevent what's known as a brute force attack where a hacker will try just all kinds of different password combinations in order to get in. However, it's still not completely safe from brute force attacks because computers are very fast. A hacker might be able to make a ton of requests, especially if they have access to a botnet that's doing this kind of stuff. They might be able to make a ton of requests all at once from all kinds of different computers until they're able to get in. They might try all the stuff in the pa in password dictionaries, which might also have not just lowercase letters and numbers and stuff, but they might also have uppercase uh, special characters, all that kind of stuff. And they might be able to just guess your password, even if you do uppercase and lowercase numbers and special characters. So while using a mix of all of those is pretty good, um, it's not perfect. So what you want is something long and memorable that also uses uppercase and lowercase letters, numbers, special characters, all that kind of stuff. Let's take a look at the first one here. AI exclamation mark 3AJHS, where AI are capital, JHS are lowercase. And that has a good mix of uppercase, lowercase letters, numbers, exclamation marks. Uh, maybe it'd be better to separate out the uppercase and the lowercase letters and numbers and all that kind of stuff. But it follows all of those recommendations. And yet, how many characters is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight characters long. That's not very long and it could be easily broken. So... Something like that is the kind of password that I think a lot of organizations encourage us to make, but they, they don't really take into account the fact that it's still a very short password, so it's still easy for a brute force attack to get in there. So what you want is something really long, and ideally you want it to also be memorable. Uh, Defenestrate 47% of all laptops, but with a whole bunch of capitalization and symbols and numbers in there is going to be a lot easier to remember than AI exclamation mark 38 JHS. And differentiate straight 40% of all laptops has a lot of characters in there. So that's going to be really, really, really hard to break in. Uh, that could take hundreds, thousands of years, depending on the algorithms and the speed of the computers and all that kind of stuff. That kind of thing is really powerful. It's easy to remember too. Uh, the You can just remember the mental image of throwing your laptop out of the window and then going to like, I don't know, some computer store, picking 47% of their laptops and throwing them out the window too. Um, that mental image is going to help this password stick. This is the uh, advice that Edward Snowden gives on that interview that I mentioned previously. 
uh, doing a long and memorable password like this is really helpful. Um, so it's okay if there's a lot of word looking stuff right here, if it's still very, very long, and if it still has a lot of good, like, kind of, I, I don't want to say garbage in a sense, but it has a lot of um, stuff that makes it look not quite like dictionary words in between. So like the two exclamation marks after defenestrate, 47% right there. Uh, the, some of the numbers in Defenestrate and Laptops, this might make this a relatively strong password. Um, hopefully, I'm not proven wrong in saying this, but I would consider this strong. Um, that's the kind of password I would make right there. Also, don't reuse your passwords. Don't use passwords for multiple websites and also signing into your computer or, or whatever. It should be one password for one service. The reason why is if you use a password for five different companies and one of those companies has some sort of hack and all the users, uh, usernames and passwords for that company are leaked, that might get put into a sort of password dictionary where people might be trying that username and password combination with other services to see if you have if you happen to use that password for some other thing so let's say your bank um your bank web website gets uh, broken into you lose the password for that but you also use it for your uh, doctor's patient portal well a hacker might be able to get in there and steal even more really sensitive information uh and sell that and now you possibly have a case of identity theft so don't reuse your passwords. Uh, there's also a thing called a password manager, which I'll have to make a rec uh, recommendation for in the aforementioned Canvas page. But it can essentially um, generate passwords for you for websites. And these might be like uh, 45 character long, complete gibberish mixes of letters and numbers and symbols and all that kind of stuff. Just absolute impossible to guess impossible to remember but this password manager keeps track of it and then usually there's either an integration with your browser or you would um, go into a password manager application and request the password for the uh, website and stuff like that uh, and usually that password manager is protected by a password or maybe some other secure means and then you unlock that password manager using your password manager password, your one password essentially acts as a universal password for everything, even though the password manager makes sure that all of those websites have different passwords. So it can be really helpful. Um, you have to be careful with how you use a password manager. Uh, sometimes they store data in the cloud so that you can use that password manager across multiple devices, which is not the most secure, uh, even if they encrypted it is not the most secure but they might store it in the cloud um or if you have one that's just local to your one computer then you might not be able to access anything controlled by that password manager from any other computer unless you transferred that password manager's data over to that computer so it's tricky but it's an option we talked about browsing data a little bit, how history, temporary files, and cookies can have sensitive information. It's not guaranteed, but it's not not guaranteed. So that's something you have to be wary of. You can clean all of these from your browser pretty easily. You go into your browser settings. You should be able to find the history and an option to clear history. And then you want to select options to clear the cache and the cookies as well. Uh, it will log you out of everything that you're currently logged into. Uh, it might make things run a tiny bit slower, but it's probably not noticeable. Um, but you can absolutely do that. Oh, the other thing with cookies, I think I forgot to mention this earlier, is that some companies use cookies to track you across the internet. I think Facebook was pretty notorious for this, where they would put tracking cookies on your computer. And then even if you were signed out of Facebook, uh, that cookie would remain on your computer and Facebook based advertising or stuff like that would be able to recognize your Facebook account and add 
information about the page you were on to the data that they were holding on you. So that's another reason why you might want to delete cookies like that. Less of a security thing, more of a privacy thing. But you can clear cookies from your browser. It's super easy. You can also use extensions to help delete cookies automatically, um, which I will provide some recommendations in that Canvas page that I keep talking about. But that's really nice because once you stop using a website, um, especially if it's something that you were briefly on for research or whatever, and you're not really going to use it again, it can just get rid of all of those cookies and you're no longer being tracked or anything like that. So that can be really helpful. These uh, um, add-ons can help delete cookies at the end of a particular browsing session. Uh, the textbook says use CCleaner. Do not use CCleaner for a couple reasons. Uh, they It has been known to have malware in the past. It has in the past had um, harmful software on like on that uh, program. So I believe what it was is that CCleaner was hijacked by malware. At least that's the, kind of the story that was being told. Um, so either the company working on it at the time put it there intentionally or it was put there without their knowledge, which means that they had pretty lax security as well. Uh, it also in the past has been known to monitor everything that you have been doing on your computer and send information back to its parent company. Right now, CCleaner is used by, is owned by Avast which makes the Avast antivirus, which is also known to be uh, spyware, which we'll discuss spyware in, at some point in this chapter. Um, but Avast also was, while it was checking your entire computer to look for uh, viruses and stuff, it was also making notes of the files that you had on your computer and reporting that information back to its parent company. Um, so the fact that it did that kind of stuff means that a lot of security experts do not trust the vast and a lot of security experts do not trust CCleaner. Even if they don't currently do it, the fact that the Avast company has done it in the past makes it not great. So do not use CCleaner. Um, like I have here, I'll have some up-to-date recommendations on the Canvas page. With all of this, we have this whole idea of security versus freedom or security versus convenience. If you're cleaning out all these cookies and temporary files and stuff like that, your browsing uh, experience is going to be a little bit slower. You know, you might have to constantly re-log back into websites or something like that. But that's something that you have to be willing to give up for increased security. Or, you know, at the very least, you have to make that decision whether you are willing to give that up for increased security. Does this possible um, exposure of your history and cookies and temporary files to an outside intruder, does is that a big enough problem for you that you want to start deleting this kind of stuff? Or are the possibility of tracking cookies, websites tracking you throughout the web, uh, is that a big enough problem that you want to try to delete some of those cookies that are tracking you. Uh, there's middle grounds. Some of the cookie deleting extensions are really smart about it and they don't, you can make it so that they don't delete things like your cookies from your email or that they only delete cookies from certain websites or stuff like that. You can configure that pretty well, but that's a choice that you have to make for yourself. If it's personal or if it's regarding an organization, that's a choice that you either have to discuss with other people in the organization in order to good, come to a good standpoint of like, okay, this is the level of security we need. Or if the security protocols have already been made, then you just got to follow it and deal with any sort of re-logging and stuff. Now, speaking of organizations, uh, for how organizations should respond to security threats, we have two uh, dimensions right here, the security policy and risk management. So the organizational security policy is going to define how an organization actually handles the sensitive data that they have, whatever sensitive data that might be, uh, data regarding employees, customers, um, 
products that they're trying to develop, whatever. Anything that would be bad if they lost control of it, it will define exactly how they use it and how uh, that is shared, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, I can really get into it right here. So an example data security policy or privacy policy would entail, you know, exactly what data is stored. And I really mean exactly here. So if they're storing employee banking information, they're going to talk about what aspects of that information are they storing? Is it something like um, addresses that they send checks to if employees do that? Or is it something like, um, the uh, actual routing number and account number for an employee's uh, electronic transfer for direct deposit, all that kind of stuff. Um, any sort of sensitive data, they're going to be really exact about what they're storing. Uh, they're going to talk about how data is processed and who can access data. Uh, is that data shared and with whom is it shared? They're going to be very exact about with whom is it actually shared the exact terms of what is being shared, all that kind of stuff, whether there's any sort of like anonymization where they remove certain like identifying information and stuff, or if identifying information is necessary, they would ideally put that in their data policy as well. How to obtain copies about data, uh, of data that is stored about people, they'll have a description of that and how to request changes to inaccurate data. So this kind of stuff would be available for um, anybody who is affected by the organization's uh, data storage. Say if it's something like a social media site, they're going to have a lot of this kind of information in their privacy policy, and uh, you would be able to look at that and see exactly what they're doing with it. But this is really important for data security because they know exactly what should be done. They have all of that outlined. It, helps then further develop employee policies regarding that data. And it helps um, recognize if something has gone wrong because of an error or malicious action or something like that, if they see something has happened to the data that is not outlined on this very specific data security policy. So that's the benefit of having an organizational security policy. And this is just for data. Um, any aspect of security, whether it's physical security, whether it has to do with employee procedures and all that kind of stuff is going to have their own type of security policy within the organization. And that's going to be really important to maintain a good security culture within the organization. Now, specifics of this policy is going to depend on the organization. Is the organization uh, governmental or is it uh, not governmental? Is it a public uh, company or is it private? Um, is it in an industry that has certain requirements on data, like healthcare or financial or something like that. So it will all very much depend, but usually you see a lot of these aspects that we talked about in a data security policy, no matter what, it's just that there might be a little bit extra added in some more uh, strengthened security uh, practices. Now, the other aspect of an organization's security safeguards is managing risk because it can never be fully eliminated. So they have to proactively balance risk versus cost, which we've talked about a little bit throughout this whole uh, chapter so far. And the specifics, again, depend on the organization, uh, depend on what they are doing, whether it's governmental, whether it's uh, financial or healthcare or whatever. The actual specifics will depend on the need for specific security levels, but the organization, no matter how much security they need, how much, no matter how much um, they are bound to, legally speaking, they will always have to manage risk at some point because risk can never be eliminated. So they're making trade-off decisions based on the, the data and the hardware that they need to protect, and they need to evaluate the safeguards relative to the probability and the frequency of threats. So again, I'm going to take us back to the threat uh, loss scenario type thing, all these possible threats that might happen to a company and all the possible ways that those threats could induce loss. And depending on the company, some of these different uh, threat loss scenarios like uh, human error plus unauthorized data disclosure leading to procedural mistakes or something like that, could all that could be you know, bad, but not the end of the world, or things could be really bad. Um, so 
say, uh, computer crime and unauthorized data disclosure, uh, any of those scenarios in there, pretexting, phishing, spoofing, sniffing, hacking, could be really, really bad for a financial institute or a healthcare uh, organization or a government or government contractor or something like that. All that could lead to the disclosure of really sensitive data. So that kind of thing, they would have to, you know, probably put a lot more cost into, whereas um, an individual or a really, really small business that's kind of out of the way and doesn't have a lot of competition or something like that might not need to worry about computer crime as much, maybe a little bit more with human error, less on computer crime. So they might not have to invest a ton of cost into mitigating the risk of computer crime. So it really does depend on organization. So what we have here is, again, the, um, the figure that shows all the different components of an information system, the hardware, software, data, procedures, and people. And we have all these different safeguards that an organization will have to take in order to manage the risk across each one of these different type of safeguards. Now, over the next two videos, we're going to talk about the technical safeguards, the data safeguards, and the human safeguards in order to make sure that all the hardware, software, and data, and the procedures and people are all safe. So that will be what we cover in the next couple of videos. We'll start in the next video with technical and data safeguards.